Excellent. So our second speaker is Dan Stewart. He's a lecturer in ancient history at the University of Leicester. And Dan has a, he's been working on cultural interaction in the Hellenistic and Roman Eastern Mediterranean. And today we'll be presenting a paper entitled The Power of Place in Greek Archaeology, the Impact of Text and Sensory Experience. Thank Oops. you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing me into the session. I'm very aware of the fact that I am employed as an ancient historian who does archaeology in, <laughs> in a uh, theoretical archaeology conference. Um, and actually, one of the things that when I put in the abstract, or I saw the call for papers, and I was like, oh, I got something to say about that, and I banged in the abstract. And then when the other abstracts came out for the session, I had a moment of panic where I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> But I think that one of the things actually that uh, struck me about, about Kelly's paper is thinking about what determines significance. And what, deter what determines significance for different communities, uh, for different practitioners of archaeology and heritage, uh, and how that relates to issues uh, in the construction of knowledge uh, in particular. And so when you're thinking during my talk, what is he doing here? Just focus on that. It's about <laughs> what determines significance. So the um, century turn in archaeology has had an interesting impact on classical archaeology in particular, uh, in the way that it's enlivened the world that we thought we knew so much about. From studies of polychromy, which have exploded our understanding of buildings, sculptures, and burial, as we're going to hear later on, uh, to thinking about the smells of tanning or the offerings of entrails, the noise of traffic or ritual processions in the ancient world, the taste of taverna meat or Spartan black broth, a focus on the senses demands a shift in the perceptions of scholars. Now, perception is always tricky when it comes to studying the classical past. It's no big surprise or revelation to say that different people experience the world in different ways, different cultural backgrounds, different social classes, different ages, different expectations, all of these things and more frame the way that we interact with the material world. Yet in classical archaeology, many of our perceptions of the past are shaped by what we might think of as a monolithic perspective. Rich, educated elites uh, who wrote down what they thought and what they believed provide a limited frame through which to perceive the ancient world. But the perspectives we adopt matter. The video in the background here is showing how the same kid experiences the world from two different perspectives, in a stroller or in a baby carrier. Aside from the prominence of butts, it's a neat <laughs> analogy for some approaches to, phenomenolo to phenomenology in archaeology, that simply being in a space impacts how we experience and understand it. It helps govern the mode of engagement and where our attention is focused. And one of the common critiques of phenomenological approaches is that there's no one way to be in the world or experience it. Uh, and this holds true for uh, broader sensory approaches as well, I think. Our starting assumptions necessarily impact our engagement. And with certain assumptions, everything is ass, essentially. So my argument today is that within classical archaeology, many of our starting assumptions regarding our engagement with place arise uh, from our engagement with someone else's perspectives before our own. Those perspectives come from ancient texts, and those texts shape how we're engaging with the material remains of the ancient world. Unlike other archaeologies, archaeologies, classical archaeology, and specifically archaeology in Greece, which is what I work on, have often started from textual representations of place, with the result being that text is the axle around which archaeological practice, interpretation, and experiences of place revolve. In the process, we are creating complicated and complicating relationships between archaeological material, textual descriptions, and physical experiences of place. And these have had a demonstrable impact on the development of classical archaeology in Greece and our understandings of the lived experience of the past. For those of you who are not classical archaeologists, uh, first my condolences, uh, classical archaeology benefits from access to a plethora of textual records <laughs> relating to life in the Greek and Roman past. Poems, drama, letters, inscriptions, histories, rhetoric, philosophy, curses, graffiti, coins, monuments, laws, debates, 
whatever you can think of, essentially, just about every possible form of writing and genre survives in greater or lesser extent from the ancient world. Being able to read and access the words, the thoughts, the grammar and language of ancient Greeks and Romans has meant that classical archaeology as a discipline has its foundations in the association of ancient text and material image. Archaeological remains have therefore been viewed through the prism of the ancient texts. Often students' first engagement with the cultures of the Greek and Roman past is through those texts, but even if it's not, the discipline is built on other people's engagement with those texts. In other words, different readings of the text can be glimpsed in the material and visual reconstructions of the remains. For though we view the remains as objective material facts, the recovery and presentation is filtered first through the primary textual material by the archaeologists. And this results in a past reconstructed through the intersection of ancient texts, ancient material culture, and changing modern interpretations. Clear-cut implications of this can be seen in the early engagements with archaeological sites in Greece. But we now understand them as sites of layered interpretations, varying both in time and interpretive focus, early archaeologists tended to privilege particular periods in history over others. And that necessarily impacts longer-term archaeological understandings. And this has uh, important implications for any diachronic attempts to engage with the sensory turn as chronology gets collapsed in the presentation of materials in the Mediterranean. So in the 19th century, the nascent nation-state of Greece cleared the Acropolis of any monuments dating to periods after the classical uh, and promoted those associated with the concepts of European high classicism. Classicism, the ideology that promoted the aesthetic accomplishments of Greek art and architecture, privileged the text-driven elite view of 5th and 4th century BC Greece and resulted not only in the removal of Byzantine and Ottoman monuments but in the reconstruction of classical monuments based on the surviving texts of authors like Herodotus or Thucydides or Pausanias. While visitors might be left with the impression that what they are viewing is simply the remains of 5th century Athens, what they are really viewing are the results of centuries of excavation, conservation, interpretation, and reconstruction. In many cases, they arrive with an expectation of what they will find, given the prominence of buildings like the Parthenon in the popular imagination. Yet what they are seeing is a pastiche of 19th and early 20th century ideas of what 5th century BC Athens should have looked like. The intervening centuries, the accretion of monuments, churches, mosques, and histories has been removed from the Acropolis. So a problem arises when we think of the texts as only being fixed points, that our contemporary readings of them are the correct readings of them when in actuality what appears immutable is anything but. The fact that the discipline has engaged with the past first through the text can have important impacts on what we study, how we study, and the way in which we construct knowledge. We can see now that the 19th century privileging of 5th century BC readings of Athenian history has had a detrimental impact on subsequent engagement with the Acropolis. Because archaeologists had read their Thucydides, their Herodotus, and their Pausanias, they thought they knew what the Acropolis was supposed to look like. The question I would ask is, why are we any different? From 1898 to 1902, and again in 1922 to 1933, Nikolaos Balanos took this engagement with text, and against the advice of many of his contemporaries, to be fair, began a restoration program on the Acropolis. He was an architect by training and a civil engineer by profession, and after the, an earthquake of 1894, he was appointed by the Greek government to oversee the consolidation of the damaged Acropolis, in particular the Parthenon. An international panel of experts recommended no full-scale reconstruction, but by the 1920s, Balanos was proposing to rebuild the North Colonnade with its entablature, uniting the east and west sides of the Parthenon for the first time since 1687. He wanted to undo the unfortunate history of the Parthenon's post-antique destruction. And through the use of modern Portland cement, iron reinforcing bars, and the judicious reincorporation of ancient building materials without really paying attention to where they were originally, uh, he created the modern vision of an ancient monument. 
Now, what does that have to do with sensory archaeology? Well, those interventions necessarily impacted people's sensory engagement with the archaeological material. In a famous case in 1904, Sigmund Freud, and yes, I'm aware I'm using both the Acropolis and Sigmund Freud as examples, visited the Acropolis with his brother. He wrote about experiencing a disturbance of memory, where he felt profound joy and some shock at experiencing the Acropolis just as we learned at school. He then goes on to interrogate his own feelings, saying, the situation included myself, the Acropolis, and my perception of it. I could not doubt the evidence of my own senses. Of course, what he's experiencing, his shock at encountering this familiar yet unfamiliar Acropolis, as he had learned from books, is that he's not experiencing the past at all, but a contemporary interpretation of that past. Freud is a complicated and complicating example, but he's not experiencing the 5th century Acropolis. So Balanos's intervention led to the further destruction of the monument. Within 10 years of their completion, the iron reinforcements oxidized and expanded, splitting and cracking many of the ancient materials that they were supposed to hold together. The drive to restore a monument created a new phase in its historical life cycle, despite the perception that it was turning the clock back. But this is not an isolated case, and it's not consigned to the early days of archaeology. Earlier this year, a debate about the date of Pompey's destruction flared up again. Was it October or was it August? Based on competing readings of archaeological results and ancient texts. And of course, those competing perspectives bleed into the presentation <coughs> of archaeology to the wider public. <coughs> Uh, ADNA research on Roman cemeteries reportedly showed a surprising amount of genetic diversity, according to the media, but who in classical archaeology was surprised by those results, that the ancient world, and that the Roman world in particular, was diverse? Right. Uh, I myself was unsurprised that the Daily Mail went this way uh, with their reporting of that incident. And in fact, anybody who was at the session on mythic pasts this morning, perhaps, also has further food to thought uh, for thinking about the ways in which um, our material is translated uh, for the wider public in these ways. So the ways that ancient texts and our assumptions about those texts impact our interpretations is particularly significant for classical archaeology. I also think it has real relevance to the utility of the sensory turn uh, for the discipline. So I want to spend the rest of the time unpicking a specific case study, a monument classical archaeologists feel we know well, but we really know very little about. And that's the temple known as the Hephaestion in Athens. This temple sits on the <coughs> west side of the Agora, on a hill above the main Agora space, which was the main kind of civic and economic space of ancient Athens. The original structure was probably built sometime in the 440s BC on pre-Persian war foundations, but it was unfinished until the 420s. Despite its age, it is the best preserved temple on mainland Greece, largely thanks to its conversion in the 5th century AD to a church of St. George, which it remained until 1834. For a hundred years after that, it was a museum, at which point um, extensive archaeological work uh, undertaken by the Americans took place in the area around the Agora, uh, and they expropriated uh, the Agora from its inhabitants at that time and began this massive and still continuing program of excavation in the heart of Athens. Despite its nearly continuous use and preservation, the, its identification has been a matter of debate, bless you. At various points, it has been seen as a temple to Heracles, to Heracles and Theseus together, to the Amazons, to Yacchus, to Zeus Soter, to Ares, to Apollo Petroeus, to Aphrodite Urania, to Demeter and Persephone, and to Artemis Euclea. But really, there have been two main identifications in the literature for this structure, as a temple to Theseus or as a temple to Hephaestus. Crucially, all of these identifications rely on particular readings of text and material culture together. The argument is never wholly textual or wholly material. Its longest lasting attribution has been as a temple to Theseus. There are literary records going back to the medieval period that mention a Theseum in Athens. Cyriacus of Ancona mentioned it in 1436, and Jacob Spahn and his fellow traveler George Wheeler 
visit it in 1675. Historical records around the Venetian siege of Athens use it as a landmark. Uh, here it is over here to describe the bombardment of the Acropolis. Uh, and it, but it was British architects Stuart uh, and Rivette in the 1750s who really put it on the map, recording existing ancient buildings for the express purpose of creating models for architects. And their drawings of the Thessalian inspired neoclassical buildings on both sides of the Atlantic. This is my particular favorite one here, where you can see kind of the facade of the Thessalian, I guess, then, and then, what's this? <laughs> but, <laughs> I think it's great. The, uh, <laughs> the reason, of course, that they called it the Sasean is that it has, an, it has a, a decorative frieze on one side of it and sculpted metopes depicting the labors of the hero Theseus. There's also a handy reference to it in an ancient text in a guy called Pausanias, who I also work on. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take up the rest of your conference talking about <laughs> Pausanias. But he basically wrote a description of Greece in the second century AD which is the basis for most classical archaeological work in the 19th and early 20th centuries in Greece. Now Theseus was an early mythical king of Athens, one of its mythic founders and a local hero, and he had stories of labors very similar to Heracles, uh, making him an Ionic version of a wider Doric supranational figure. He was also a profoundly political figure in 5th century BC Athens, with the politician uh, Cimon undertaking an expedition to recover his bones and bring them back to Athens. That the bones were found on the recently conquered island of Skiros, a strategically important place in the Aegean, is significant. So it makes sense that the 5th century Athenians, with their wealth and their imperialism, would build an impressive temple to this vitally important and locally important mythological figure. By the 19th century, that attribution was a certainty. The Thessalon was famous in antiquity as a place of asylum for the subjugated, especially slaves. In recognition of this, the new Greek state made it one of the first national museums in a free Greece. It had been a church for 1,300 years and a temple for 1,000, and now it was going to be a museum to this new, newly created state of Greece. This early identification of the temple as the Thessalon was due in part to this decontextualized application of our textual source to the only visible temple in the vicinity of the Agora. The identification of the Thessalon was thought to be supported by the subject of some of the decorative sculpture on the temple, which do show the deeds of Theseus, some of them. And seeing the building as the Thessalon also shaped the way people experienced the structure not only as a well-preserved temple, but as part of a nationalist narrative about freedom and subjugation in this new nation state. And it had implications for the identification of all the other archeological remains in the vicinity. Topographies of Athens have always been based on texts. And having a visible surviving monument to hang them on as a material check has always been part of the process. Like it's still going on today. Um, so we can see that in 1813, where we can have, that's the Thessalon right there. We can see it in 1890, this is Dorpfeld, the famous kind of German architect and archaeologist, also using the Thessalon to reconstruct what he thinks the Agora should look like prior to excavation. We can see it in 1909, when Robert just forgoes all of material culture and decides to reconstruct the topography of the Athens based only on the description of Pausanias. He uses the Thessalon on the top of the hill um, as a material check. And we can see it in the 1930s with the American school's Agora excavations, where they are also using it. Uh, here they've labeled, again, this is the Thessalon in 1930 as a check on their kind of their practice of archaeology. And this is like a state plan that we would recognize within archaeology, and yet you're still applying these labels from the texts. Until we get to 1936, and then it is no longer the Thessalon, but now it's the Hephaestion. So something has happened in 1936 to shape the foundations and the identification of all of the surrounding archaeology. <laughs> so large-scale excavations had begun by the Americans in the Agora in the early 1930s, and crucially also by the Germans 
in, this, in the area of Athens called the Karamaikos, which is also quite close to the Agora. And it was much harder as a result to fit the textual topographies onto the recovered material record. Uh, the gymnasium that was supposed to kind of allow us to see where the Thessaion was, was found close to the Diplon Gate on the other end of the Karamaika, so not anywhere close to the Agora. So which made it much harder to see how that fit with Pisanius' description of the Thessaion being hard by the gymnasium. The Americans unearthed an architecturally significant stoa uh, right under the, the hill of the what we now call the Hephaestion. Here they've called it the, the Stoa Basileos, the royal stoa. Stoa, that's wrong, actually. The, the, we now think the royal stoa is over here. It's tiny, kind of much more insignificant, but this was architecturally beautiful, and so therefore must have been the most important stoa uh, as a result. And if that was now definitely not, uh, if that was the royal stoa, that could no longer be the Sisaeon. So what was that then? And of course, the Americans turned to text again to try to figure out what that structure was. <clears throat> now, excavations had also unearthed um, foundries and evidence of metalworking in this area of the Agora. And our handy dandy guide, Pisanius, also tells us that above the royal stoa is the Temple of Ephesus. And so, therefore, if we have the combination of kilns and foundries, metalworking in the Agora, this, if this other thing is the royal stoa, then this must be the Temple of Ephesus that Pisanius tells us about. Hephaestus was the god of metalworking. He's the, kind of the lame smithing god who made Ares' armor and Apollo's arrows and Zeus's thunderbolts. But what are the evidence of the temple itself? The sculptures of Theseus. Well, suddenly everyone remembered that the other side of the temple shows the labors of Heracles and the battle of the centaurs and the lapis. And none of those myths have anything to do with Theseus. So maybe Theseus wasn't really the prime focus of that temple in the first place. The uncertainty that surrounds the Hephaestion is integral to the way the temple has been interpreted. Without a smoking gun, those who identify the temple on this hill as the Hephaestion have had to rely essentially on a single line of Pausanias and a circumstantial corroboration provided by the excavations of kilns and foundries uh, on this part of the Agora. This was interpreted as evidence of an industrial sector consistent with the construction of a temple to Hephaestus, the patron god of workers uh, in this district, but of course that's somewhat circular. It's a Hephaestion because there's foundries nearby, there's foundries nearby because it's a Hephaestion. The notion that the Hephaestion is located on this hill because the area was the home of the metalworking industry has in fact become an unexamined assumption that shows up repeatedly in handbooks. And there was an article that came out, I think in October of this year, after I submitted the abstract, which made me panic as soon as I saw the article, because I was like, I don't have a paper now. Uh, <laughs> actually talks about something slightly different that, that tr attempts to date the kilns and the foundries in relation to the Hephaestion to try and figure out which one came first uh, and whether this Hephaestion can reasonably be called the Hephaestion or not. Um, and talks about the issue of a cult to Hephaestus, which is actually very unusual in the ancient world to have a physical location for a cult of Hephaestus. Um, there's hardly any known. So selective and evolving readings of text are why the Hephaestion in central Athens is currently called the Hephaestion. But earlier readings of the same text, albeit a slightly different line of it, are why we used to call it the Thessaion. It's not that the text is wrong, it's that we're generally terrible at disentangling textual landscapes from the contemporary ones we stand in. Current presentations of the topography of the Agora neatly label everything as if certainty exists. But many of these structures are identified only on the basis of textual evidence and our current reading of their literary topographies. So everything in red is all the stuff that has a label associated with it that only comes from Pisanias or some other textual source. There's no epigraphic evidence from those places that tie those places to those names. Frequently, there's epigraphic evidence that relates to these cults and these places, but they're not from this bit. They're from elsewhere and secondary or tertiary kind of deposits. So this is a problem, I think, for any detailed sensory turn in the classical archaeology of Greece. Right? In other words, we don't know what we think we know. 
Making one-to-one -one correlations between text and material culture is at best generalizing and at worst completely misleading. The exciting thing about these texts is not that they tell us uh, what happened when, because they don't, but instead it's a glimpse inside someone else's mind and the culture they operated within. That's a remarkable opportunity, I think, when it comes to developing a nuanced sensory archaeology of Greece. But it's not without problems. Mark Twain once said, get your facts first, then you may distort them as you please. Our ancient authors and modern archaeologies have taken that to heart. Our texts are often subject to repeated reinterpretation, reimagining, and rereading, resulting in a complex mix of relationships and outputs. The result is a contemporary archaeology that is a curious uh, superimposition of different experiences of place from different times, presented as a single image. Part of the complicating factor of a sensory turn in classical archaeology is in our starting positions. If we stand on that hill with the Thessaion at our backs, the experience of the Agora below is different than if it's the Hephaestion at our backs. The grace notes of the orchestra of ritual carried out in this sacred place become different as a result. Do we hear the cry of slaves aching to be free, or do we feel the heat of the kilns and the furnaces? Oh, I was supposed to do that slide and I forgot. Okay, here is a textual description of something familiar. Dio is writing in the third century AD and is describing a giraffe, uh, which he calls a camelopard, because it was then introduced to Rome by Caesar for the first time. The animal is like a camel in all respects, except that its legs are not all the same length, the hind legs being the shorter. Beginning from the rump, it grows gradually higher, which gives it the appearance of mounting some elevation. And towering high aloft, it supports the rest of its body on its front legs and lifts its neck in turn to an unusual height. Its skin is spotted like a leopard. Here are some ancient responses based in part on that understanding of that text. Right? You might think my concerns are initially about accuracy, but they're not. Right? I don't want to get trapped on the what is right cul-de-sac. Instead, I'm much more interested in how text leads to particular representations. Why do they think like this? What assumptions lead from this description to that representation? What about the broader culture makes this make sense to them, especially when they're, they're seeing giraffes being exhibited in provincial capitals, in Rome, you know, and if you're an African, in in the part of the African part of the Roman Empire, you, that's where the giraffes are coming from. <laughs> There's a trade in giraffes. People, uh, you know, they, they had zoos in the Roman world. So why are they representing them like this from those descriptions? What makes that an acceptable representation? Uh, and for me, the value of these approaches is not in the answers they provide, but in the questions they're forcing us as archaeologists to ask about the material that is foundational to our discipline. So there's an opportunity, I think, for classical archaeology to contribute a nuanced and complicated sensory archaeology um, by embracing both our textual and material sides to create this kind of much more nuanced reading of experience in relation to the ancient world. Thank you.